All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. about us. We're actually right down off Main Street here in Greenfield. And um, we basically design and install solar PV residential and commercial systems. Uh, there's a little blurb about the Clean Energy Center Solar Loan Program, which is providing loan support for uh, residential systems. We also do a lot of tracking solar and renewable energy policy for Massachusetts and helping everybody understand all of that. It, the minutiae can be quite um, nauseating at times, uh, both with the DPU and the State House. Um, and then, of course, give us a call when you're interested in doing PV. We're also interested in talking with folks about anything we basically covered today. If you have questions about lots of things we can refer you to, lots of different paces. So this is a general outline of some of the topics that we're that are on our radar screen for what we think about when people want to be green. Um, we can, we, we don't have enough time to cover all of these in any great detail, so I kind of want a show of hands of which ones people are really, really interested in. So climate change, heating and cooling, transportation, plastic, Transportation, okay. Plastic, food, renewable energy. Plastic is important. Plastic, plastic. yeah. And then the everyday decisions. Yes. That'll yeah. probably yeah. be food, <laughs> food and heating and cooling as well, so. All right. But depending on okay. how much time you have. Yeah. All right. And so we I can think, always come back around. <laughs> yeah. So I think probably everybody knows about climate change. There's lots of bad news. There's, lots of, there's some good news, but it's harder and harder to come by. But we each have to try, because that's the only way we're going to make a difference, is each one of us does our part. That's uh, a very important quote on the bottom. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. It's up to us. Yeah. So heating and cooling. I never thought the all-electric home would actually come here, be part of my you know, persona, my scheme of things. But it's actually a reality. Because electricity can be generated by renewable energy sources, we're going to end up cooking, heating, cooling, cleaning our houses, and lighting our houses with electricity. And um, 
there are a multitude of solutions now already out there. Um, in, so for heating and cooling mini splits, which is a air source heat pump, it could be ground source also, that's a generally a larger capital outlay. Um, so most people um, go for the air source. And then there's hydronic, which is using water to circulate through baseboards instead of an air uh, ducted system. Um, there are rebates through uh, the Mass Save program and also the Clean Energy Center <coughs> to cover part of the cost of installing heat pumps. Um, it, you really need to talk to a heat pump installer to figure out what works best in your house. Every house is different. And actually, before you do that, the first thing you need to do is to air seal and insulate as best as possible. That reduces your heating and cooling load. Um, the mass, at the end, there's a link for mass save um, energy audits. There's a 0% heat loan. And there's also, they're covering 75% now of the air sealing and insulation with no cap. It used to be capped to $2,000 a year. Now there's no cap. They really want you to air seal and insulate your house. Um, and not only are there the energy saving advantages of doing that, there's also a huge increase in comfort. If your house isn't drafty, if you don't have cold walls that are causing cold air to sink and move into the house and the warm air to go up to the ceiling and get those convection currents going, you definitely feel much more comfortable in your house. The air sealing and insulation is well, well worth it. And then there's also heat pump water heaters. Um, they need to be properly located because they basically act as a dehumidifier. And because they're pulling the heat in the air putting it into the water that you then use to wash it. So you don't want to put them in a conditioned space. You want to put them in the cellar. But that cellar, you want to make sure is insulated from the first floor so that you're not still robbing heat from the house to heat your hot water. But it will, and it will dehumidify. For most of us here, we have slightly wet basements and cellars. And so that can help reduce the cost because instead of running a dehumidifier, you're running your air source heat pump, water heater, and actually taking that heat and putting it in, using that energy to make hot water instead of just hot air that your dehumidifier does. So they're, they're, that's very energy efficient. Solar hot water collectors are also very energy efficient. There again, <coughs> lots of other issues need to be taken into account as to whether or not your house is able to have hot water collectors put on it. If it's a slate roof, nobody's going to put it on a slate roof, except for Carol and Peter Letson. And their, their house has a slate roof, and they have hot water on there, so. I don't know how they got it on there. Oops. And, um, and if it's just, and the problem with solar hot water is, is that it cannot provide you 100% of your water, hot water needs. In the winter, you're going to run out of hot water that's solar heated. All the systems have a backup system, though. Yeah. All the solar hot water systems. So you don't run out of hot water, well, but just more of a fraction of your hot water is heated by whatever the backup is in the winter than it is in the summer. In the summer, all of your hot water needs are going to be met by solar hot water collectors. You're not going to be using any energy from anywhere else for heating the water. And please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand or just interject at any point in the way. Um, induction stoves, this is magic to me. I have an induction stove, but instead of your old electric wire cable uh, burners, um, there's a glass top. And the you do need to use ferrous iron um, potware, so cast iron is perfect. And it uses magnets or something. <laughs> the way an induction the, the way an induction stove works, instead of 
electric resistance, which is what toasters are and house baseboards are and the old style electric stoves, where you run more current through a wire than what the wire can handle and the wire turns red hot, gives off heat. An induction stove uses a magnetic flux that it sets up on the stove top. That magnetic flux excites the electrons in the ferrous pan. Those electrons moving in that pan <coughs> create heat. It's a more efficient way to do it. You can get more heat than you can with an electric burner using less energy. The other advantages of an induction stove is it gets hot very quickly and it drops its heat off very quickly. And it's very much like cooking with gas where you can control the temperature much better than you can control the temperature with a regular electric resistance cooked up. So it used to be I would turn a pot on with some water in it, let's say to boil eggs. And then I would walk to the refrigerator, get the egg carton out, come back, open it, put the eggs in. Well, you can't do that with an induction stove. The water's boiling by the time you get back. It's just amazing. So, and a frying what pan. What she does like more often than that is she puts the frying pan on, puts the oil in it, yeah. walks for the eggs, and comes back, <laughs> and <laughs> it's hot. Yeah. Um, they are pricier, but it's amazing. The other thing I used to do, we had a gas stove. Wooden implements, you t leave them there on the edge of the pan, walk away, and they fall off, and they burn up. Plastic Hot burns holders. up. Pot holders burn up. I no longer burn anything anymore <laughs> because the pot is the only thing that's hot. It, anything can touch the glass surface, it doesn't burn. Now, it is warm because <coughs> that iron pot is hot. So you, a child touching it is going to still burn themselves. But at least all the perimeter, no, nothing is hot. And it cools down so fast when you take that pan off of there, it's basically releasing all that heat into the air. Um, it's really quite remarkable. So all your cookware is iron-based? Yes, and it'll say on there, um, induction stove ready. And this is only a stove top? It's not an oven? Correct. There, so the oven is convection, mm -hmm. typically. So there's a fan, and it is electric then. Mm -hmm. So, and that does change slightly how you bake. I've been told that I'm not a great baker, so I haven't really noticed a big difference. I'm even saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when you say pricier, how much pricier is it the so I think it was I, the one that we bought was three thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, but, but there are little hot plates you can get that only cost sixty or seventy dollars, mm -hmm. and they're perfect for just heating up a pot of water or doing simple or cooking tasks. meals on. Yeah, and we have one of those at the store instead of having to put in a whole stove to just heat up soup and whatever else. You know, Alden Booth and Lissa Greeno, who yeah. own the People's Pint, chefs in their own right, both of them, they own a couple of induction hot plates and they sit next to, they There's sit on the counter stove. next to their stove and they use those induction hot plates. And those are 120 volts? Yeah, those are 120. Yeah. I don't hear about this stuff at all. Where can you buy them? Wilson's has them. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Or you have them. Said, right? No, we don't. No, we don't carry. We have them. one to use in our yeah. store. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. But Wilson's carrying mm -hmm. some. And now we're worried about the three thousand dollar induction cooktop range, the or cooktop and mm -hmm. range that we have. We're early innovators. We tend to buy things before mm -hmm. the mainstream is making mm -hmm. them, and they come down. So they come could down have come price. down some. And they probably have. Yeah. Ours is a Samsung in the top of the, the Chef series Samsung. So does the induction, the stove, the unit that you're talking about, the three thousand dollars, does that include the convection oven? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. it does. Okay. 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 Yeah. It was a it's a whole. Unit. It's a whole slide in okay. convection okay. oven, induction okay. cooktop, right. stainless steel. You know, right. it's what was available at the time. Mm -hmm. It was a nice one. We got it. So smart meters, smart thermostats, those are all. Uh, we have now at least programmable thermostats, but there are coming up 
new ones that will actually learn over time what your habits are. That you tend to come home at this time and turn the heat or the cooling on and you tend to leave at this time. And that they will start learning your schedule so that it'll just start guessing and predicting. <coughs> Unfortunately, we are predictable people. Um, and then smart meter sets on the outside of the house. Again, I'm not sure why I stuck it here. What does that have to do with heating and cooling? That can almost go in policy stuff. Smart meters but, is, let's save that one for later yeah. because that's something the utility needs to do. And we can have a conversation on how we can try to push the utility into doing right. what they should be doing. And then maybe it's the all electric. It's the all electric. That's, that's why I stuck these in here. And then EV is electric vehicle charging. Many houses now are starting. You can actually use just your regular um, outlets to charge your car. That's called level one charging. Then there's level two charging, which is like your dryer or your electric stove plug in. 240 volt. And then there's level three, which you won't have in your house. But you can install level two charging so that instead of taking 20 hours to charge your car, you could charge your car in nine hours. Uh, level three could charge it in an hour and a half. And this that would be a bolt, which is about 260 miles range. Right. Is that what you see like at various stores or something like that? Mm -hmm. that Out in the parking lots. Yeah. Well, some stores well, will have threes and some will yeah. be twos. Oh, okay. You'll you You'll, if you have an EV, you'll learn very fast. There are apps on your phone to figure out where they are, and you'll recognize which ones um, are located where. Uh, because instead of knowing where your gas station is, you need to know where your charging stations are. But then you get to go thumb your nose at all the gas stations when you drive by. <laughs> <laughs> and then solar battery backup. At some point, we're all going to have batteries in our houses so that we can actually help the utility build a reliable, resilient grid. Because we'll actually absorb the power during the day that our PV systems are generating, and then let the house use that power at night. And there'll be other, um, other uses for the utilities during the day when people who don't have PV need more power, there's a peak load, they may pull some from that battery. But these are all things that are being developed mm, you know, all across the country. Although Hawaii and California are probably on the cutting edge in terms of incorporating a lot of those technologies. There's a lot of solar PV battery back up in Hawaii. Yeah. And some in California. Is it affordable? So in Hawaii, because electricity is almost 40 cents a kilowatt hour, we pay about 18 to 22 cents. So it's twice as much. So imagine you have a $150 electric bill and it's $300, $350. Then it becomes more affordable to put in battery backup. And also there's actually an incentive in Hawaii to do that. Because they've reached the 30% threshold. It, um, how, uh, the number of households that have PV is over 30%. Here in Massachusetts, it's still like, I don't actually know. It's in the single digits. digits. Yeah, it's less than five. Right. So, um, but in Hawaii, so let's say one out of three houses has PV. It has become a concern on the utilities part that too much power is going out onto the grid when the sun is shining, which in Hawaii is almost every day. That they can no longer they can no longer control enough how where and how that electricity is being used. So they are <laughs> encouraging people to actually put battery backup in their own house so they can absorb their own power during the day and then use it at night. So what happens if there's too much electricity in the grid? The grid does become <clears throat> unstable. They have so, to. They have to. Um, there's a word for it that I'm not grasping at the moment, but curtailment. They have to curtail some of the power if, it, if there's too much on the grid. Because what it does is it drives the voltage up. Huh. And that can so cause damage to appliances. So why is unique? Because it's an island. They don't have anywhere they can push that electricity to. 
but let's say California and North Carolina, which are right now have the most installations of solar, if they generate more than they can use in any one time, they just push it across the borders into other areas where there's not as much electricity being used. So there are ways to take care. And then wind. It's so solar is not the only renewable energy source, and we'll go into that too. Wind is another source. Texas has more than 30% wind right now, and so it actually pushes wind power, electric generated electricity, out of its. Well, actually, it has a problem because it can't, because Texas is its own regional independent system operator. operator ERCOT. Yeah, it's not part of the main grid. It's not, not part. Grid. It's not part it's of it. everybody else. Amazingly, well, it is Texas. <laughs> anyway, so we're going into high, big, very complicated stuff. So transportation, we're not going to use fossil fuels, what are we going to use? Electricity or pedal power. I didn't put pedal power in here, but um, but there is, okay, so electric vehicles, we talked about some of that. If you're thinking about a new one, you, new car, you really should get an EV. They're up to 260, 270 miles per charge. <clears throat> so if you have an EV charger at your house, you could charge it for the nine hours at night when you're home sleeping, and you could drive 268 miles the next day, and then come home and do it again. Question. Well, the fact of the matter, though, is that electric vehicles are more expensive than the hybrids or... And the fuel source is cheaper. So, so you're eventually, paying yeah. your, like, t paying your <coughs> fuel yeah, upfront front costs are higher. So. You know, but, I think that to say, oh, just go out and buy electric vehicles a little so, uh, no, easy to say. It, it, you still have to take into account finances. So there is the federal tax credit, which is 7500 and then the state rebate, which is 2500 Now, the federal tax credit, you do need to have tax liability. So if you're retired and you don't have that much, so you don't pay that much in taxes, that could be an issue. The workaround that I've seen lots of people do is they have their children buy them their car so that the children own the car and take the tax credit and then bequeath the car to the parent who doesn't have the tax liability. Um, the state rebate comes back to you within 30 to 60 days. So that's 10000 right there. That brings the cost of an electric vehicle, certainly within any range, the range of someone who would be able to buy a new car. Now, if you're not able to buy a new car, then yes, you're certainly in a position where electric vehicles are out of the question. Unless you find a used electric vehicle. And there are those available also. For instance, the first car that we had, the first electric car we had was a Nissan Leaf. Nissan Leaf had 85 miles range on a good day, and when it was cold, it was 50 miles range. Now, that 85 mile range it's not like I had to go to the gas station every 85 miles and, you know, and that I was a real pain. I would do 85 miles in a day. I'd do a lot of site visits in a day, and I'd put that 85 miles on, and I'd come back to Greenfield, and I'd park it behind Wilson's and charge, or I'd bring it home at the end of the day, and I would charge it home. And the next day, it's ready to go again. I didn't have to make a trip to the gas station. I didn't have to do anything out of, out of the ordinary. And it was actually, you find it easier than, oh, my car's out of gas, I've got to go drive to a gas station, I've got to do something. You get into the habit of charging it up when it needs to be charged. And for a lot of people, they're not doing anywhere near 85 miles a day. They do 20 miles a day. And every few days, you bring it home and you plug the car in before you walk into the house. So a used electric vehicle can work a lot better for people than they think at first blush. And then if you need to drive further than 85 miles, there are apps on your phone to figure out where the charging stations are. And for a LEAF to charge on a level three is half an hour. And you've got your 85 miles back. And you have to go pee. And you have to get something to eat. <laughs> so not maybe every hour and a half, but certainly for a trip of 200 miles, you could easily take advantage of it. Now, when we bought the LEAF, which was in 2015, 14, 15, 
There were very few charging stations, so you really had to map out your route so that I could drop him at a charging station if it was further than 85 miles <coughs> so that he could charge there, have lunch, and come back. Um, but now there are many, many more charging stations available. So it's becoming less and less of a worry. And it will be, at, in the future, as we go along, less and less of a worry. <coughs> Some of it is because we're out here in Western Massachusetts. Boston can't remember that there is anything called Western Massachusetts. Because when you go to Boston, there are charging stations every block. I mean, they, and they don't need them every block. <laughs> but anyway. Just curious, who, who, who makes the money on those charging stations? Is that, does the money come back to Greenfield, or is there is it So there was a grant program that the state had, and a lot of the towns, when they put in the charging stations two, three years ago, those came through that grant program. And there is fact another grant program that just started again to put in more charging stations for municipalities. And now they're extending that to businesses, because they understand that businesses not only for their employees, but to attract customers to come. So someone with an electric vehicle knows, oh, that ice cream shop has got an electric charging station. I'm gonna go there and get ice cream at the same time. Maybe not ice cream, but grocery stores, or liquor stores, or uh, other commercial entities. So it's become much more popular now. People, but you have to put money into those, right? Some you do, some you don't. Really? So the grant ones should be all free. Wow. There are many competing uh, charging facilities. So ChargePoint, PlugShare, Green Lots, um, I don't remember, EVgo. Uh, so there's a number of these companies. And you can sign up for their plans, or you can just pay because you need to for that one time, um, which is clearly a little bit more expensive. It might be $10 for one charge up. Uh, but if you were new, you needed to use that one many times over the course of a month, and you'd sign up for a plan that was maybe $5 for the month, and that we'd give, charge you only $2 each time you charged up. I'm kind of making these numbers up. They're a little bit real, but they're not absolutely, because a lot of these plans are also figuring out what works for their customers. They're trying to understand what the marketplace needs. And so there's a lot of flexibility out there. What's the average reliable electric gas car cost these days? I mean, I haven't priced it. So a Nissan Leaf is probably in the low to mid 30s at this point. Probably in the low 30s. Yeah. Um, with the $7,500 federal tax credit and the $2,500 state rebate, that brings it down into the low 20s. The Chevy Bolt was a $40,000 car out the door, and the federal tax credits and the state rebate brought that down to 30000 So that makes it more competitive with what a... And is that a, a well-built car, or is it reliable? We... You, you have, that's yeah. what you have. And we had a Leaf for two and a half years, and when the Bolt came out, we got a Bolt. And you can go 200 and... We've done 300. 300 miles. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And you also need to learn how to drive them. Because jackrabbit starts are not good. You'll use up a lot of electricity. Um, turning the heat on also uses electricity. So you'll learn how to dress properly <laughs> for wintertime <laughs> driving. That's a um, lot easier with the bolt than it was with the leaf because the battery is just so much bigger in the bolt that you say, you know what? I can turn the heat on for this trip, and it's not going to take so much of the mileage that I can't get to where I'm going. Because it felt that way sometimes in the winter with the leaf. When, 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 I know like when the Prius came out, there was a lot of talk about the batteries were a, a potential serious problem. Did that ever come to pass? I mean, the, no. the batteries are actually no. pretty good. Yeah. I think they had for the first gen some issues about longevity, didn't they? Yeah. No, they? never with the but Prius. Not with the Prius? No. With the, 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 the Honda the Civic hybrids and the... Yes. Insight hybrids did have some. some but they issues. figured out a lot yeah. of those things. And a lot of those were warranted for 100,000 miles and got replaced <laughs> before that 100,000 miles was up. And I've seen 200,000 mile Priuses with their original batteries. So they've, they've proven to be pretty good. 
Okay, so electric bicycles. These are the best. I, everybody's complaint about the bicycle is going up that hill. <laughs> doesn't matter what hill, doesn't matter how big, how little, there's always a hill that prevents you from getting onto your bicycle. I don't care where it is. It's, and it's true for me. He can get on a bicycle and it doesn't matter where the hill is. <laughs> but me, oh, so we actually, I, I kind of was like, well, I don't know if I want to do an electric assist bicycle or how is this going to work? But I practiced on one. We were in tai Taiwan and he got a regular bicycle, rented a regular bicycle. I rented one with electric assist. We went for a 25 mile ride. We had not been on a bicycle for months. So I was, Guess was ready to go home first. <laughs> I was shocked how easy it is. And I only used maybe a quarter or a half of the battery capacity on the bicycle. And all of my capacity. And he was ready to take a nap and crash. And I was amazed. And I was still riding. And I was outside. I was having fun. And it maybe added a little bit of weight. So if you're carrying it up six flight of stairs, uh, it's gonna you're gonna feel it by you know, floor six. But if you're rolling it in and out of our garage or off and on a bike rack on the back of your car, you won't notice. And if it allows you to then ride your bicycle instead of taking a car for recreation purposes or otherwise. It's just amazing. And I have not researched what the cost is. Um, it's something we should do at some point. They probably are more expensive than a regular bike. Yeah, but there have been studies, are. actually, yeah, that people drive a, uh, ride their bike at least 30% more than people without doing electric assist. Mm -hmm. And then you can go together instead of, mm -hmm. <laughs> Electric buses, they're here. There's a whole bunch of them. And we really need to take the bus. Even if we don't have to take the bus, we don't need to take the bus, because we all believe that public transportation is a necessary part of equality and transportation for everybody, just take the bus once in a while, when you can, when you've got a little bit of extra time. And really, then, you start to understand the trials and tribulations of public transportation. I mean, you kind of know it in your head. But when you get on that bus and you have to deal with whatever's going on, it's, it's amazing that you start to understand what's really, what life is really like for, for a large part of the population. The more of us that don't have to take the bus, us taking the bus will make it easier for those that have to take because the bus system will get better if more of us take it. And it's only a dollar and 25 cents. It's not gonna break the bank. <clears throat> Electric trains, we have them actually on the East Coast. Between New York and Boston is all electric. So take as many trips by the train. We have a train stop right here in Greenfield. Now it only stops, goes down at one o'clock and it comes back up at four o'clock. But the more of us take the train, convenient. they're going to add more routes. Yeah. And that gets you down to New Haven, where you then catch more trains into New York, and then out of New York, you can go anywhere. Now, the one here is a diesel train. Yeah. Okay. The Vermont. Then, the Vermont. The Vermont. The Vermont. Yeah. And then out of New York, when you go to D.C., all of tra that track is owned by Amtrak, so it had passenger trains have priority. Once you go south of DC, freight trains have priority. Mm -hmm. So you can be at sidelined and it can be a bit of a pain. But you're not driving. You can get up and walk around. You can bring food with you, your favorite book, a good companion to have conversation with, look out the window. It's there's lots of things to do. You can bring Start your computer train. at work instead of driving. Yes, you can plug in. Got outlets. If they could subsidize them, it would be good because the trains are so expensive. You know, for my yeah. mom and two of us to go to Philadelphia, it's it's much cheaper to drive the car. It's a pain in the butt, but it's mm -hmm. so if they yeah. can only do something because about that. Because you're putting four right. in that right. car. Yeah, 
Yeah. It was one at a time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was just so expensive. Yeah. yeah. It, it actually used to be subsidized, but they've been cutting that back, yeah. just like the post office used to be subsidized. Mm -hmm. Now it, all, every society is on, what is it, you know, you pay your own way kind of. Mm -hmm. Anyway. And then electric planes. Well, I, I hadn't put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> we have to dream sometimes. Okay, plastic. We have way too much plastic. It's really, really, really bad. So just take one week. Pick one week when you have a lot of flexibility. You don't have to deal with visitors or a conference or something. And just decide you're not going to use plastic that week. And see what you can do. <coughs> It'll really open your mind up to using glass, glass jars, ceramic. Even aluminum foil, if it's reused and eventually recycled, is better than plastic. Because plastic never goes away. Even if you recycle, so we have, we recycle plastic. But anyway, uh, it's just, we really need to think about how, do something different than plastic. And there are clearly instances when we need to use plastic. But we can all, I'm sure, figure out in, you know, every day one or two things that we can give up that's plastic. Now, if you've got some containers that you're using at your house that's plastic, continue using those over and over and over again. But it's the new plastic that you bring in. Think of it as you, you own that plastic. It's part of your daily existence. And you can't just throw it away. That would be way too easy. So you've got to figure out how to take care of it. Before they actually recycled milk bottles, I used to keep all the milk bottles, those, you know, H-P-E-D-E-2, number two, the kind of milky <coughs> plastic jugs, in the cellar. We had piles. <laughs> Because <laughs> I could not throw them away. Mm -hmm. I knew I could recycle them. And then when we got to recycling, it was like, here, here, please <laughs> take them. And that's wonderful. So there are certain kinds of plastic that we can recycle and hopefully reuse. And then that's the other thing. Buy products that use recycled materials, even if it's more expensive. Because the market needs to grow. and by growing, the cost will then come down. And we're not talking huge amounts of money here. So if you can't do it every day, just pick a day when you can to think about, I'm not going to use any plastic today, and try and really understand your relationship to plastic and how it affects your daily life. And there's lots of blog posts about people who have tried to do one week or a day with no plastic. And you can you know, Google those and read them. And they're very interesting. The issues that people come up with, how they get around it. There's lots of creative ways to work around not using plastic. Um, and then, yeah, the usual reduce, reduce, and reuse, reuse, reuse. And only then recycle. Do you have anything else about that? Okay. Food. So this is a study that just came out from the Guardian newspaper. 80% of farmland is used for livestock, but it only produces 18% of food calories and only 37% of protein. That's abysmal. I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. And then all these other things that are clearly bad. Now this is also... Uh, CAFOs. Uh, Confined animal feed lots. operations. Yeah. So <clears throat> our grass-fed local farmers here who grow beef are not as bad. But then, so here's beef at the top, a beef herd. It results 100, kilo, 100 grams of meat. 100 kilograms. Oh, yeah, okay. Got it. I equals 105 kilograms of greenhouse gases. While tofu, uh, just down to is only 3.5 kilograms. And so even if you just cut out beef, 
I, I, it's interesting, they've got crustaceans in here, uh, which is shrimp and uh, lobster and, um, you know, crabs. Um, if you just cut out beef, it'll vastly decrease your carbon load. If you could cut out all the way down to cheese or pigs or, yeah, right in that range, then you're cutting, reducing your load even more. Um, and so it's interesting to me how all of these pieces fit together because at one point I thought nuts, like almonds and cashews, oh, they use a lot of water. And I was really worried about how many almonds, and I love almonds, to eat. But then when I saw this, I was like, but it's just water. And the trees are growing there year after year. And you're not replanting new almond trees every year. And they're just picking them. So it is not anywhere near as bad as beef, which I used to think, well, if I get grass-fed local beef that's, you know, the cows are named and they're pet every day and, and it's local, someone that I, a farmer that I know, that'll be okay. Well, it turns Very out Very much in moderation yeah. as a tree. What's in that? Yeah. And then I talked to my doctor. She was looking at my cholesterol. She was looking at some other indicators, and I said, she said, well, um, basically avoid all fat or oils that are solid <clears throat> at room temperature. And, um, and I said, you know, I just realized I eat chicken fat from organic local chickens that I know who grew them and I you know, cook it and everything. But I just realized it doesn't matter if it's local or organic or anything because it's still a fat at room temperature, solid at room temperature. And so it's still bad for me. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So beef is bad. It doesn't matter where it's come from. For all of us, all if we were to eat it three times a day. So over time, we can all work on this. And I don't know what other pulses are. John said someone is going to ask. Somebody's going to ask. <laughs> what it looks like chickpeas and lentils and well, yeah, beans. 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 Yeah. yeah. Beans. OK. So peas are the best. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I love peas. That's well, how peas are separate. Right. <laughs> and so that's the article. Avoiding meat and dairy is the single best way Biggest, single biggest way to reduce your impact on the earth. They said it was even better than buying an electric vehicle. Mm. So everything, you know, you, we all make choices and balance things out. So of course, local homegrown, your local CSA farmer's market, if you grow your own food, organic is certainly better, but local is probably more better you know, we all make these decisions every day, how, what to eat and what to do. Although, basically, it's not just food, it's everything needs to be local. So, don't, you know, um, but clothing is really hard, but there's everything in between. So, I'm, my brain is a little empty right now. Um, so, then move to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> See. That's what happens when your brain's empty. <laughs> Do you want to do this? Or? Um, yeah, I could do that. Since your brain was empty. Uh, I, I can. So for renewable energy, we do have a few choices of what we can use here that truly is renewable. Um, we certainly need to move towards more solar and more wind. Hydro is a bit of a question in my mind. Um, for wind, there's not enough in Franklin County for anybody to do it at their own homes or for any of the municipalities to really make a good case for doing anything um, right here in our local area. In Berkshire County, there's some ridge lines that are a little higher, probably have a little bit better wind resource. You know, there might be, you know, Roe, Florida, um, a case can be made for for wind there, for onshore wind. What we really have a lot of here in Massachusetts is offshore wind, and we really need to 
develop the offshore wind, especially since that's closer to where our consumers of electricity really are. Mm -hmm. um, what is really a tough nut for us to crack in Massachusetts for our energy needs are like Boston. Um, so offshore wind, bring that right into Boston. Um, we do have a problem with the political capital that we need to expend to do offshore wind. Um, our governor, I don't think, is very forward thinking as far as renewable energy. He likes to say that he is. I'll disagree. Um, so far, we have much less than, than two gigawatts and only like a total of two gigawatts projected. That's what's in the, um was in the last energy bill that passed in April of 2016 was a capacity of two gigawatts of wind. So gigawatts sounds like a lot, but two gigawatts is less than 2% of the electricity demand in Massachusetts. So it, it's abominably small. We, and we need to move so much faster to get to anywhere near 100% renewables by 20. It's the same problem with solar, but we'll get there on another slide. Um, hydro. Hydro is a real mixed bag also. And when hydro gets talked about in Massachusetts, um, the conversation tends to center around Hydro-Quebec and the transmission lines that need to get built to bring Hydro-Quebec electricity down to feed our urban areas in Massachusetts and in New England, and specifically Boston. And there are so many problems with flooding of indigenous lands, flooding of land that could be carbon sink, um, you know, the growth of the whole Hydro-Quebec facility there. Canada should be offsetting some of their other generation of energy with their hydro instead of shipping it down here for us to use. We are making someone else be responsible for our problem. We're kicking the can down the road. And the whole big reason for the push for Hydro-Quebec into Massachusetts, the Canadians have their own reason. They want to profit on it. But the reason we are looking for Hydro-Quebec to be <coughs> here is because the utility business model is a 100-year-old business model. What they were incentivized for 100 years ago is to get electricity into every home. Back when it was really easy for their business model to be a hydro facility in Turner's Falls and several households very close by with a lot of meters there, a lot of captive customers, that it was very easy for them to get a lot of customers without much capital cost. They would get everybody in, in Turner's Falls electricity because there were a lot of people paying for that. It was easy for them to make their money back. Same thing with Shelburne Falls with their hydro facility there and Buckland and Shelburne Falls, a lot of homes in a small area a lot of captive customers, it was really easy for them to make their money back. But if somebody on Orchid Hill Road had a farmhouse up there and it was eight miles of transmission lines and distribution lines to get electricity up there, the utility would never think of doing that. We're not going to put all those poles and wires up there to that house just for one customer. We will never make our money back. So the regulators, the Department of Public Utilities, at that time determined we will figure out how to incentivize the utilities to put power to that house on Orchid Hill Road or that power you know out past the Montague Plains or wherever it was it was too far away for the utility to want to do it. They said utilities we will pay you whatever it costs for you to run the infrastructure out to that house and put electricity at that farmhouse. 
we will give you whatever it costs for you to borrow the money and pay the interest on that money to do it. We will even make a sweeter deal than that. We will guarantee a profit for you. We will guarantee a rate of return to your shareholders. But please put new infrastructure in to go out there and bring electricity to those farmhouses. That was the Rural Electrification of America program in the 1920s and 1930s. It was a great program for them, for getting electricity to these houses that the utility would never think of doing it. But you know what? That business model has not changed. So now, the utilities collect their money from the sale of electricity to you and from the pass-through of electricity for getting it to your house. That's how they collect the money. But the, the regulators, the Department of Public Utilities, at their rate cases say, wait, how much did it really cost you to do business to bring this electricity to people's homes? And you can keep enough for that. You can also keep money for putting in new infrastructure, new pipelines, new transmission lines. You can profit on that. You can pay your shareholders a guaranteed rate of return on that. But we determine how much money you get to keep. So the, regular, the utilities look at that and say, the only way that we can satisfy our fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders <coughs> and give them the most profit that we can give them is by putting in new infrastructure, mm -hmm. new transmission lines, new pipelines. So whenever there's, and I'll put it in quotation marks, not enough energy in New England, mm -hmm. how do we find a way to get more energy here in New England? We can't put solar on people's homes. Yeah, we can't good. put offshore wind. <coughs> But we can put in new transmission lines from Canada. We can put new pipelines up from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> it's not because that's the right thing to do. It's because a 100-year-old business model gives the utilities an incentive to put in new transmission lines and new pipelines. So any question that you ask them, that's the answer they're going to give you. Hmm. Got it. There's another. Uh, we go back. Do you want to go back? <coughs> yep. the small hydro. Yep. So small hydro facilities like what they have in Holyoke, and in Holyoke they've done a pretty good job with their fish lifts, and you get pretty good fish passage through Holyoke. Cabot Station. There's a lot of things that are good about Cabot Station. It's a small facility that was built you know, to serve the area in Turner's Falls, and we're still using it. And it's already built, it's already paid for. We don't have to put more concrete into the ground. We don't have to um, process more lime and all the, the um, carbon emissions it takes to make concrete, because there's a lot of carbon emissions there. It's a resource that is already there. We really need to improve the fish passage at the Turner's Falls Dam, and we need to hold the utilities account, the owners, the generators. First Life Power, which is owned by a Canadian pension fund, is who owns the Cabot Station at this point. We need to hold them accountable and put in better fish passage and, and do hydro that is a sustainable way of doing hydro rather than a Cuisinart that chops up all the fish that go down through it to try to pass and keep all the fish from passing up through. A fish ladder that's made for salmon is not going to pass fish that can't swim as well as salmon can swim. And then we have um, the Northfield Mountain Pump Storage Facility, which was built as part of the 1970s nuclear build out. When energy was going to be produced by nuke plants, it was going to be too cheap to meter clean, reliable, safe, it in many ways has turned out to be none of those. And all the new plants are shutting around us and instead of taking that base load electricity, a new plant cannot ramp up and ramp down and ramp up and ramp down like our demand does. 
So they needed in the 70s a place to park that electricity at night. Use it all up at night, put it up on top of the mountain, it runs back down the mountain during the day and produces electricity and takes off some of the peak of the daytime load. That was great when we had a glut of baseload electricity from nuke plants. But as the nuke plants shut down, we are now using fossil fuel electricity to pump that water up to the top of that mountain. That is a net energy loser. It operates at 68 to 72 percent efficiency. That facility wastes enough electricity to power 30,000 homes. If we could mothball that until we get enough wind that, and solar that we can use that to, in a clean way, put the water up to the top of the mountain, that's good. But don't just take hydro on its face and say, hydro is good, hydro is clean. It looked like there was a question. Uh, backing up to the wind. Yeah. Yeah. Has there ever been an estimate of total offshore wind capacity and the amount of wind energy that would be needed to help Boston? Massachusetts has got enough coastline where they could put offshore wind that Massachusetts could be a net exporter of electricity and you know export to other places on the East Coast or export inland. And I don't, I can't run the numbers for you, but I can tell you that the East Coast of Massachusetts has been called the Saudi Arabia of wind. So there's plenty. We just need the political will to do it. And you can move on to solar if you'd like. Solar. So given those other two resources are fairly limited here in Massachusetts, we really need to put PV up. And right now we only have two gigawatts installed. So it, it's, uh, and Governor Baker has a new program called the SMART Incentive, which I think is on the next slide, that'll cap solar to under four gigawatts. These are all still teeny weeny, itty bitty little numbers. Um, and net metering, which is the process, does everybody know what net metering is? No. Net metering, so if you generate electricity at your house, it goes out onto the grid, and then at night, you use electricity from the grid so the electricity goes back into your house. The net meter keeps a track of how much goes out and how much comes in. And, and you net the difference. Mm -hmm. you at the end of every month. Pay the utility or you net the credit from the utility. So that ability to net meter, it started in 19, I think 78, on a project in the Bronx, where actually Stan <coughs> Strong, who's one of the pioneers, just decided that he was gonna put PV up in this facility, and the utility was going to be happy about it. <laughs> well, they became happy about it later. But that, so net metering gives all of us the ability to be connected to the grid, to use the grid basically as our battery during the day, because most of us aren't home and the PV is generating, and then to take from that battery or the grid at night. Net metering, though, is capped how much the utilities, each one of the utilities, National Grid, Eversource, Unitil, NSTAR, has been capped do, since about May or June of 2016. We haven't done any big projects since then. There's an exception in that under 10 kilowatt single phase, which is what most of us have in our houses, or three kilowatts three phase, we can still get net metering credits if you're that size or smaller. Anybody bigger gets a market rate which means that you only get 60% of the value. 40% stays with the utility. So instead of sending, so you're sending out 100 kilowatts, let's say, and you're only getting paid for 60. That seems to be a problem for us. So it's really difficult for any systems going in larger than 10 or 25 to make it work out financially. 
because it affects your payback, it affects your value. Now the only cases where it doesn't is if you have all behind the meter load. So let's say you've got a factory that's cranking three shifts every day. Is that right? Yeah. Three shifts every day, seven days a week. Then you can use that power behind the meter. At its full value. At its full value. And not worry that you're not net metered or that you're only getting 60% value because you're using all that power behind the meter. So there are many bills out uh, in the legislature, in the state house, to deal with a number of these different issues, to try and work around uh, some of this. But it's, um, it's a backlash that the utilities are trying to reduce and basically eliminate how much solar is out there. Now, what's interesting is, is that if the utilities own the solar, we would be swamped. They love solar as long as they own it. Because it is cheap to make electricity. It's very easy to manage. There's no moving parts. It doesn't break down. It just goes on the land. Or part or you know, rooftops. But because we want to own it and we want to have some control, the utilities are fighting tooth and nail, particularly here in Massachusetts. So Eversource, in their rate case, um, which got adjudicated by the DPU, and the DPU agreed with them because the DPU commissioners were appointed by Governor Baker. We now have, for Eversource territory, uh, I think this is the next slide, yes, a demand charge for new residential solar systems. What this means is that you're not just paying you know, 15 cents, 18 cents a kilowatt hour for what you're using. You also will be paying for new residential solar installations. Extra money for the long, for the most power you use in a 60 minute period, in a one hour period. So let's say you turn on your dryer, you turn on the television, you turn on the air conditioning, you turn on the oven, and you turn on, what else, the well pump kicks on or the electric hot water heater turns on. All those get stacked up. Any one individually isn't gonna be a big amount, but all of them stacked up within that one hour period, and especially if you have teenagers in the household, you can't control who's turning on what when. You'll end up with, a, could be, 30 to $50 demand charge on top of your electric bill every month. Just because that because highest one hour sets your <coughs> demand rate for the rest of the month. <laughs> Sounds it's a it's a wet dream for the utilities. It has never been enacted in the United States except for one teeny tiny little utility in Wyoming somewhere. Nowhere else in the United States are there residential demand charges. So that has happened now? Or they is ruled on it. The DPU has ruled on Eversource's case, and it is allowed. It will start in January of 2019. Okay. Now, there is a bill before the legislature, S2314, which says you can't do residential demand charges until you give people smart meters and, some abil and time of use rates and an ability to moderate their usage path which you can't now. If you go out and stand at your utility, you have to stand at your utility meter 24 seven in order to figure out how much electricity you're using. Mm -hmm. Or plug in, you know, uh, what is it, a whole house uh, electric counter monitoring system. But who's gonna do that? And it doesn't matter because if you have particularly teenagers, there's no way to control when they turn stuff on and off. And you don't know when your well pump turns on or your hot water heater. And, and it only takes one 60 minute period in 30 days. So you're really, really good for 29 days and then you blow it on day 30 because someone came to visit, something happened, you had to turn stuff on. It's completely untenable. And it's discriminatory. Right. Because it's only for solar it customers, solar. it's not for non-solar customers. No, I live in a town that has a municipal electric mm -hmm. utility. Would that apply? No. To one of those? 
So this is only they justify this. <laughs> no. They didn't have to justify this. No, it's I mean. called regulatory capture. They only had they to justify it to the DPU, and the DPU commissioners are um, industry. Yeah, well, we, but, but Mass is going to be the only place in the country. So National Grid this. actually asked for this in Rhode Island. Rhode Island said no. And Eversource said, well, we're going to ask here and see what we can get. And the DPU gave it to them. Hmm. That's over. Mm -hmm. So there's suits now, and there's <coughs> legislation. Yeah. We shouldn't spend a lot of time yeah. on this either. And there's also a new smart incentive for solar. If you're ready to do solar, we, we can go into the details about that. Also, there should be solar ready new construction, which is just passed in California, but we don't have that yet either here. And then this is the new utility. What we really, really need is a new utility business model. We do not, we're done with rural electrification. Everybody has power. In fact, there are people now who are building houses if you're more than a quarter of a mile from a pole on the street, people are putting in solar and batteries, not connecting to the grid, because it's cheaper. It costs them $25,000 to go a quarter of a mile. A quarter of a mile is not that far. A lot of these houses are built, you know, where are you up in the boondocks? So it's, prices for solar and batteries are all going down. It's the, the, it's what's called a death spiral for the utilities. And they're actually helping us do the death spiral against them. We are not trying to put the utilities into a death spiral. spiral. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy for them. They are making... My vision of what the utility business model should be is that they are a platform upon which other things are laid. Distributed generation, various storage. different forms of electrification, storage, and so on. The utilities should be incentivized for efficiency. The utilities should be incentivized for customer satisfaction. The utilities should be incentivized for carbon emission reductions. What the utilities are incentivized for now is growth, new pipelines and new transmission lines. So what do we see? New pipelines and new transmission lines. If we incentivized the utilities for customer satisfaction, for energy efficiency, for carbon reduction, you know what? We might even see satisfied customers and energy efficiency and carbon reduction. But that's not what we're seeing right now from the utilities. So these are some of the everyday decisions that we all can do. Basically, it's just to be much more mindful of our choices, because we really do have choices that we all make every day, and they have consequences. And then I have a list of things here that uh, some of them are on the yellow postcard in the back of the room. Really. It makes a difference when you call Governor Baker and your legislator. Either you're, well, unfortunately, we don't, depending on where you're. We're you running are. out of legislators. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, and those are the, I, I don't know, the most important, but they're important things to ask for. There's also other important things to ask for, like single payer health care and all that. But <laughs> so, what did we raise for questions? Oh, and there's some links here for. And I think the well, we'll provide the PDF to GCTV. They will post this on their website, so you can go back and review the slides certainly, and um, and get the links to the different programs. One or the other of this is always available for questions. You know, at the store. Mostly. Mostly. So you guys install solar as well. Yeah. A Greenfield, the town of Greenfield uses somebody else to do uh, the PV squared. That's not you guys, is it? So there that's was a solarized program in Greenfield, but that's it's finished. Old. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which gave Greenfield residents a lower cost. That lower cost, though, now actually we're all lower than that, so you wouldn't yeah. want to yeah. follow yeah. that program. Yeah. 
weren't yeah. you saying something about a, another mass solar thing? Did you say, and then we were going to talk the about mass, it? The oh, mass the solar, solar loan. loan. So here, the Clean oh. Energy Center has a solar loan program where you can borrow up to thirty-five thousand and get ten or thirty percent loan support based on your income. Uh, we have a chart back there, and there's also a flyer for the solar loan program. Um, Franklin First Credit Union and UMass Five are the two banks in our area who are participating lenders. So we work with them, and basically, what it, your monthly payment for your loan, which is over a 10-year period, is at either at what your current electric bill is now or lower. So you're never spending more per month than what you would have for electricity, but you're getting solar power generation to offset that. Have you found many problems with um, roofs leaking um, upon installation? Um, Not that we've done. Okay. <laughs> there was a house in Amherst that the array I think blew off. That wasn't the house, that was, was UMass. It? Oh, it's UMass? Okay. That was one of the UMass arrays. Um, the but we have construction techniques for doing roof installations have gotten better over the years. Um, back 10 years ago, um, for an asphalt roof, drill a hole through the asphalt shingles into the rafter, fill the hole full of silicone, Take your lag bolt and your L foot, run the lag bolt down into the silicone. Some of it might squish out. Silicone all around the L foot, silicone around the top of the lag bolt, and pray. Mm. <laughs> and that was the installation. Better techniques now. Much better Much. techniques now. Um, eight by 12 aluminum flashing with a standoff built into the middle of it. Um, with a lag bolt that would go through that and then a cap that goes over it that is your L foot, that is your attachment point. So that flashing goes under one course of shingles and over the next, acts just like a shingle. And you've got two layers of protection right there where it's sealed. And there's a neoprene washer too. There's a neoprene washer on the How long bolt. do those last though, in the near, before it deteriorates? Um, long time? 20 years, 30 it's, years, two years? It's not exposed to UV, um, and it's under a cap. Because it's got a cap so, over it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Those are going to last a long time. And it also stands an inch proud of where the, where the water plane is mm -hmm. on the roof. And do you have people that do your installations? Um, yeah. That you, yeah. 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 We've worked you don't that some contract out a lot, you just, you have one group we've or? we've got we one partner group. yeah yep. it's a family master electrician contractor mm -hmm. and we've worked with them for almost 13 years now right so. Yeah. so we've got the same staff that we had 13 years ago mm -hmm. I don't think there's <coughs> well they've had they even say more that. crew on since then Yes, the cousin Garrett came on, so it's not just, it's not just the father sons. and the sons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's two yeah. sons. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. This, is, this is a real family operation. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Meeting house. Yeah. And that was a tracker. So it yeah. faces the sun all day long. Wow. Yeah. And it'll generate 30 to 40% more electricity. They're just wonderful. To me, it's like moving sculpture, just like the wind. Mm. Too many spots in one huge room, much bigger than this room. Diagonally, heat or cold year round. Mm -hmm. so How about in the, in the winter time with the snow? Um, so it depends on the pitch right. of your roof, whether you'll get locked in. A really shallow pitch that's not going to shed snow anyway isn't going to shed snow any better with solar on it. So you can't you can't tip them. They have to follow the. Content. It's not worth tipping if you've got a really shallow roof and you're trying to tip. You have to space them apart from each other, and they're going to slide off the solar panels, but they'll just build up on the roof because the roof is so shallow. Yeah. Uh, what makes the most sense is to put them down flush to the roof, mm -hmm. and 
even if that's not the perfect pitch because it doesn't shed snow, you're going to gain more production in the summer than what you lose in the winter because it's a shallow pitch and the sun is high in the sky all summer long and the summer days are longer. Right. Yeah. So there's trade-offs to both. And if you have access to that roof, you can always use a snow broom to clear off the without, snow. Without, without damage? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah really? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Not snow rake. But a, um, <laughs> we have, it's yeah. a foam thing. It's a foam, yeah. 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 Now that ours we use the plastic. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's more than 30 feet tall, you're probably not going to get out there and deal with it. And what I tell people is if it's a shallow enough pitch and it's not getting enough sun on it that it doesn't melt the snow off. Don't get crazy about it, because if it's not melting the snow off, it's not going to be a lot of solar production anyway. Hmm. And if it's that shallow a pitch, it's going to crank in the summer. Yeah. It'll make up for it. Yeah. That's the benefit of net metering. And that's one of the benefits of being grid-tied, as opposed to being off-grid. If you're off-grid, you need to be really concerned about what power you make in the winter, because Winter's when you need it the most. Winter's when you're going to be cold if you don't have it. But being grid tied, and so doing a, an off grid system, I look at that as being a personal solution. You're taking care of your own needs. But if you're grid tied, there's more demand on the grid in the summer than there is in the winter. So if you're putting more power on in the summer than what you need, what you use at your own home, you're being part of a community solution. You're helping offset what someone else has not done for putting solar on their home, either because they can't afford it, or they're tenants and they're not allowed to put it there, or the roof is the wrong orientation, or they've got too much shading, or any of the things that probably only 20 to 25 percent of the homes in Massachusetts are good candidates for solar. You know, otherwise there's tenancy issues or there's orientation issues or shading issues. Slate roofs. So we've actually found that probably half of our installations are poles or trackers. And the other half are roofs. It's really moved away. Yeah, we're about out here half. because there is so much more land available for folks. Mm -hmm. People are either choosing to do pole or tracker systems, or need to. That's their only option. How about neighborhood solar, where <clears throat> someone doesn't have? Some so community solar is certainly something we need to do. The the financial and um, interconnection logistics are phenomenal, though. So um, because of that market rate, uh, you just can't make community solar work under that. So it needs to, that whole net metering uh, debacle needs to be repealed. And there are some um, bills before the State House to bring back full retail net metering for low-income and community solar projects. Um, it, uh, the, the situation in the state house in Boston is awful. Basically, Baker rules the roost, and DeLeo, who's the Speaker of the House, even though he's a Democrat, it's a Demo he's a Democrat in name only, and um, he does basically what the utilities want at this point. So I'm very pessimistic about um, this legislative session will end at the end of July. We will see what happens. Um, I mean, everybody still needs to make the push to call and urge because you never know what turns people. What <clears throat> you know? What happens? So we have to try. We can't just sit back and say, "Oh, boo hoo." But For instance, the previous chair of House Ways and Means, Tom Gold. Not House Ways. Um, no, T. -Wee. T. -Wee. Telecommunications, Telecommunications Utility and Energy has 
appeared all along to us like he's just going along with the utilities at every turn. And um, what was it, the MMRC, the minimum monthly reliability charge that the utilities got. The Eversource. That, that Eversource got in their rate case. Golden was livid. He said, we gave you the latitude to try to take something for yourselves. We never expected you to do what you did, and we never expected you to put it in front of us and get it without even a conversation. He was livid. Mm -hmm. You never know what's going to turn people. And the utilities, or Eversource, certainly could have shot themselves in the foot with that one. They lost the trust of one of their advocates. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Wow. Again, we have two months. I believe you said North Carolina is doing a really good job. Is there a quick, is there a quick answer to why? It's because Duke Energy. Is yes, they're not. Duke Energy is the utility yeah. in North Carolina, and they own the solar. They are putting in hundreds of megawatt size fields, not teeny little things. Yeah. In fact, residential solar in North Carolina is a teeny market. So they're making big. Right. Yes. Yes. But the electric rates in North Carolina are in the seven to ten cents range. So, it, it, um, but as long as Duke owns it, they they don't have any problem because, I mean, you can install utility. We're talking three, four hundred megawatt size fields. They're acres and acres and acres, and they can probably do that for now under a dollar a watt. There's no democratization of solar in North Carolina. The little guy can't own it. The little guy can't benefit from it. The utility, it. utility owns it. Yeah. Yeah. There was a new bill that was passed last summer where um, Duke was supposed to start like 5,000 residential projects, but it's still being debated now. So Here's another interesting way that Duke operates. There is net metering in North Carolina oh, yeah. where if you overproduce in a given month, that goes into your credit and you can use that up in another month where maybe you don't produce as much as what you use. But they have an annual true up and their annual true up is June 30, 31, how many days are in June? It's the end of June anyway. So what happens is during winter and spring, you're generating electricity, building a credit, building a credit, building a credit, because air conditioning season hasn't started yet. When air conditioning season's ready to start, they take your credit all away, and they It'll say, start, start, over. start all over. Start all over. Oh. It's sleazy. <laughs> and their yeah. hugest electric uh, or cooling load is July. Yeah. 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 Well, July is worse. July is just worse. Yeah. And ju July and August. Yeah. Cute. Yeah. Disappeared. So they're not they're not dummies. But <laughs> they all game the system. Yeah. yeah. So any other questions? We bored you to tears. Thank you very much. Oh, here. Yeah. One in the back. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to thank you, Claire and John, for coming out and doing this. It was very interesting. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Very much. Uh, I also want to ask you this to get your opinion to go away with. Um, after what you just said about the um, like possibility or feasibility of community solar, uh, I'm going to be 70 soon, and I have a house on my own. It is, what do you th what do you think the chances are of seeing community solar in my lifetime? Probably not. <laughs> well, in the next thirty years, something will happen. Well, see, I'm wishing for a hundred. You know, I mean, at <laughs> least I can I can hope for my son and not for our our yeah. um, our children. But um, it doesn't sound like community solar well, is going to be around like ten years or something. As soon as we get a democratic government. It'll change, flip flop back. Yeah. It's because Governor Baker is in office. 
See, everything good that's happening with solar right now has been started under the Patrick administration. And we, we were actually involved in the solar um, net metering task force negotiations when it changed from the Patrick administration to the Baker administration. And the chair of that net metering task force was changed to a Baker uh, appointee. And the tone and tenor of those entire negotiations changed completely. And the, the negotiations wrapped up not long after that. And I read the um, executive summary of what those were, who were written by the chair of the Department of Public Utilities, who was the one that came in and became the chair of the Solar Net Metering Task Force. And my first question was, did the person that wrote this executive summary actually sit in on the same meetings that I sat in on and get the same long document of this? Because the executive summary was completely different from any of the documentation. And the executive summary showed how solar doesn't work and it's just not viable. And it cost non-participating rate payers money. But what the utilities were doing, what the utilities forced in that case was a cost-benefit analysis that took the cost to the utilities with none of the benefits to the ratepayers factored in. And they called that a cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. It didn't look into avoided fuel costs. It didn't look into um, avoided infrastructure costs. It didn't look into what, what it was benefits. environmental benefits, social benefits. It didn't look into any of those. All it looked at was what it was costing the utilities, and the utilities were trying to make a case for a cost shift from participating ratepayers, meaning <coughs> solar owners, to non-participating ratepayers, saying that what the solar owners are doing, they're doing on the backs of others, where the numbers could easily show that putting solar on the roofs of houses in Massachusetts in distributed generation are a benefit to the solar owners, to the non-solar owners, and to the commonwealth at large. So we said our hope lies in getting another governor. The Democrat. <laughs> so the new smart incentive, it's possible that there could be some community solar under that program. Um, it, it, some, a lot of the details are still being turned out on that, so I just can't tell you. Is there, do you know of a way that you can like, hook up with other like-minded people maybe that are in your same circumstances as a elderly person who might, you know, be interested in solar but probably on a fixed income and yeah. just not feasible at all, but, you know, hook up with other people that are more informed about this kind of thing than I am um, to get support from them and doing the So there uh, is a group in Greenfield that's called Greening Greenfield. Greening, so Nancy, I've yeah. heard of that. Yeah. Nancy Hazard, uh, Susan Morgaptic, Sandra Boston, Pam Kelly. Um, that's a very active local group that not just uh, electricity or solar, they work in a number of areas. Yeah. But they would be a great group to tie okay, into. The Greening group, Greenfield. Is Greening called. Greenfield. Yeah. Do you know of a physical location that they have? They don't have an office. They don't? Um, uh, I think if you call Town Hall, they, they would yeah. give you contact yeah. information. Because I don't have a computer or do... Yeah, yeah that makes it more difficult. Like email yeah. on, on, <laughs> right. on the yeah. website or whatever. So right. I'm strictly a calling somebody mm -hmm. on the phone or going to a physical right. address kind yeah. of person. Yeah. So call the town hall and yes. just ask them. And they'll you give you a right. reading of Greenfield. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. You're very welcome. Thank you. Very much.
All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions.